some land your way. We are lucky to have Vince Gray here. He's a graduate of Western's MLIS and has been employed as a data resource librarian at Western since 1986. He's been chair of the OCUL Data in Ontario Working Group, president of the Canadian Association of Public Data Users, and currently sits on the External Advisory Committee of Statistics Canada's Data Librarian. which, as was stated, is the ground floor of the D.B. Weldon Library, not the, not the basement, it's the ground floor. As of yesterday, there are now signs pointing to it. So if you come in the front door and look down the stairs, you'll see a sign that leads you down the steps to the Map and Data Center. I want to talk to you a bit about the services generally in the center, and then we'll go into some of the data retrieval tools and services that are available to you. Uh, there are three librarians employed in the Map and Data Center, one specifically for maps and two for data. Uh, we can assist you with locating maps, locating data, manipulating them if necessary. So if you come up with a file that is in a strange format and you need it in SPSS, we can try to beat it into submission and create a SPSS file that you can use. We also have, as of January this past year, I think it was, a GIS technician. Um, he, she can provide you with help on using GIS. If you've got a GIS project, she can help you with that. Are you familiar with GIS, or am I saying already saying an acronym you're not familiar with? Looks like an unfamiliar acronym. Geographic Information System. So you can do online mapping. You can combine geospatial layers, which are boundary files generally, with data uh, to create thematic maps. I'll show you a thematic map later in the presentation that was created using GIS. You can overlay various pieces of information. So for example, for a business class, um, Christine and I prepared data sets that allowed users to identify where every Tim Hortons and Starbucks location in London was, look at traffic flows along the street, look at combined demographic activities about the census tracts in which they're found, so that the faculty member could construct a regression analysis to try to estimate where Tim Hortons would be located, which is something that businesses do generally. Um, so that's the type of thing that GIS can do, and I'll show you another example later. Consider the case of London, where London geographically is divided into about 70 different census tracts, the city of London. If you have a table showing average income of each of those census tracts, you're going to be looking at two columns of numbers. And that really doesn't tell you very much. If you can then map those two columns of number, combine the census tract with the boundary file, and actually see the income over the city, you get a far more immediate and lasting picture of income in London, as opposed to saying, well, census tract 001.01 .01 has this income. Define the various. Um, as of January, this coming January, we're hoping uh, to have a 10 hour a week statistical consultant available working within the lab, within the map and data center who can assist you if you have questions about doing statistical analysis, constructing a statistical model, or interpreting the results. You've done something exactly what is what does this mean? Uh, I'm 
getting a result of this. Is it significant? Is it not significant? Exactly what analysis or what interpretation should I put on this? So we're in the process. Yesterday I sent up to my supervisor a preliminary job description. We're hoping to have someone hired and in place in January. And it's a test, a pilot project for, I'm not sure if it's a year and a half or a year, but there will be someone working out of the center who can assist you if you're doing stats courses, which of course you probably no longer are doing, but if you're also doing ongoing research that you need the assistance of this person. There is a shared email address, which I provided for you on the page, uh, that will send email to everyone in the unit because don't, just, don't immediately rely on me, other people can also provide assistance. And, and maybe better at checking their mail than I am, potentially. So, what are the physical services of the Map and Data Center? Well, as I've forgotten your name already. My apologies. Um, as was said, we moved in September. Uh, it's a large, bright, modern facility. In there, we've got five computers that are available on a first-come, first-served basis with priority given to people who need to use statistical software or GIS. They have access to SAS, STATA, SPSS, and ArcGIS, so that you can use those um, and use them in proximity to people who can assist you with them if you need help. There are also two collaborative technology rooms which are virtually set, which are very close to being set up and operational. Um, as of the last weekend, some of the equipment was hooked together, more of the equipment was hooked together. And these provide you with a computer in those rooms, once again, with all the statistical and GIS software, but also the ability to hook up five different laptops to the machine and share a, by share, I mean take turns using a 42-inch monitor that's in the room, so that if you're working on a group project and different people are working on different aspects of it, and you have computers, you can share what you're doing with the whole group without having to have everyone come around and huddle by your laptop screen. So those, that, those rooms will eventually become available for booking uh, when the map and data center is not open. Uh, which would mean effectively whenever Wellman's open, those rooms will be available. Not yet. We're still working on it. We have to pr put in place some more security measures because we want to be able to supervise the use of the room even if we're not there to some extent over. To review the use of the room if necessary when we're not there. Online services. Well, the first online service is our website. And from here, we're trying to provide you access to just about anything you might need to use within our homes. We know that we don't. If you identify things that you think should be there, that you know about, that aren't, let us know and we'll consider adding them. So that's the first thing. But we do have services, how to find the map and data center, uh, how to contact it, search a catalog for print maps and atlases. So let's start with there, because that might be something that you need to do. I need an atlas of India. Okay. Atlas. Okay, by default it sorts by date. And error publication 2010, reference atlas, pocket atlas, Environmental Atlas, Railway Atlas, National Atlas of India, Science and Technology. <coughs> so it's more by far than simple, this is a map of the area. There are a lot of thematic materials that are covered, even in the Atlas collection. And of course we do have uh, topographic sheets which provide a high level detail about various areas. Those are uh, available for use as well. So, um, even finding a map or an atlas, or if you were to look and say, I want an old 1850s map of India that would have been used around the time of the uh, Sepoy Rebellion, you could look up and find something like that and see if we have something, or what we 
have that's closest to that period. Um, let's go back. And this is still tagged with the old, old format, which needs to be changed, but provides you with the correct information down here. You can download maps from GeoPortal. You can retrieve maps and data from Equinox. You can retrieve data from Odyssey. I'll be talking to you more about these as we go through. But you can also say, I want to look at aerial photos. I'm doing a review of this area in London where a uh, library was, and I want to look over time at how the area has changed. Have houses gone up? Have they been torn down? Has it moved from industrial to, um, to residential? Look at different characteristics with aerial photos or with uh, fire insurance plans, etc., etc. So there's a wide array of information available on the website that you may want to get to. One of the sorts of things that are available, well, I've already shown you the pointers to the online data delivery tools, finding tools. Um, one thing that you probably do not know about, if you didn't know what GIS is, you probably don't know that as a grad student here at Western, you may go over to ITS and borrow disks and install GIS software on your personal computer, whether laptop or desktop. And you can then take free training courses from Esri, which is the producer of our GIS, on how to use the software. Um, you can sign up, I think, for about 10 courses at once, I think is the limit. These are all online, self-paced, at your discretion, and I think generally require six about six hours to complete. So if you're interested in using GIS, you can go and take those courses online that uh, would provide you with some background in it. And if, yes? I'm sorry, could you tell us, so if you want to go over there, what do you ask for? Uh, the person to contact is Donna Saskis. Uh, her name and email address is on your hand, on the handout oh, that I've okay. given. Uh, she's in the support services building, so across the street, across Western Road, uh, right on the main floor when you go in at the very back, and you ask for the ArcGIS button, okay. and show her your student card as a grad student. Uh, undergraduates can also install software, but professors need to sign up copies of the disks for them, so uh, some of the students here, are you all libraries or information science? Or okay, because I was thinking if there were journalist students who were undergrads, their professor would need to sign up the software and provide it to the students to install on their machines. Um, <clears throat> these courses cost a lot of money if you aren't. Part of this program, I think they're generally three or four hundred dollars each, so take advantage of them. It's a benefit you have that uh, you probably don't know about and can defray some of the cost of your tuition if you're prepared to put the time in for it. Um, we have access to a lot of data online, and I think it's important that I tell you the sorts of data that we're on. First, there's the Data Liberation Initiative. This grew out of a number of consortia that went, were put in place to purchase data. Eventually, well, currently for $12,000 a year, we license access to all of Statistics Canada's publicly available data to everyone on campus. Until two years ago, when Stats Canada made the data available for free, for $12,000 a year, we purchased access to and license the data. But with the change in the DLI, we're now licensing it. If you need or want a personal copy of a CD-ROM of the Canadian Community Health Survey, you can write to Stats Canada and they will send it to you. But you have to create, a you have to sign a personal license for it. Under the Data Liberation Initiative, everyone at Western is covered for research purposes, educational activities and institutional planning within Western for access to their publicly available data. One thing I'll add right now, thank you for asking the question. 
If you have questions, please interrupt, because otherwise I'm just going to keep droning on and on. Um, now, these are census results, results from the National Household Survey, which replaced the long form of the census for 2011, which was supposed to replace the long form of the census for 2011. Um, topical services, so general social surveys, Canadian community health, uh, surveys of literacy activities, depending on what you're looking for. Or there may be a wide range of data that might prove useful to you. And I'll show you how to locate those. We have data, we have licensed data from the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research. This is a consortium run out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan. It is an international data source. There are primarily, but not exclusively, US data in this collection. But there's a wide range of information. So if you want to look at characteristics of every felon in the, in the US penitentiary system, you can look at a data set relating to that. Um, if you're interested in data that were used to assess the impact of slavery, there are a number of series of data sets used by Fogel and Dingerman for their book, Time on the Cross, that came out in the 1970s that looked at how bad slavery was, or whether slavery was bad. It came up with some other controversial conclusions, which then users looked at the data again and rebutted. So interesting access to data. We have data online from the uh, Source OECD Library, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. If you're looking to compare country to country, an international organization that collects data from all the countries and puts them into the stand, a standard format is far better than trying to get data from different countries and make them match. If you can find matching data to start with, half of your work is probably done. Um, anecdotally, for example, uh, when I was looking, I work with an economics class, the fourth year honors program, and a number of years ago, we were looking for data on exports and the importance of exports, value of exports of shakes and shingles between the US and Canada, roofing tiles, cedar roofing tiles. And I came up with about four different figures for values and four different figures for volumes, depending on which website I was looking for, whether it was the US government, Canadian government, Canadian Producer Association, US Producer Association. So if you can find someone who collates the data into a standard format, that's most helpful. Uh, we have data from the International Monetary Fund. There are four large databases, direction of trade, government finance, balance of payments, and one simply called international financial statistics, which once again provide comparable data on a wide range of things. Then there are free data available World Bank, for example, World Development Indicators, etc. But part of the point of this is if you need data and you don't know where to find it, come to us and see if we can help you locate it. Because we're fairly good at tracking down something, or tracking down something that may be a proxy for what you want. It may not be exactly what you need or what you were looking for, but it may allow you to measure those characteristics. Uh, we also have map layers for GIS, and these largely come from the DMTI Spatial Smart Program, which provides us with access to about a million dollars of uh, geospatial layers uh, on an ongoing basis. If we were commercial, that would be what it would cost to purchase everything. And also to the Ontario Geospatial Data Exchange, which is the Ontario government clearinghouse for maps and for data. A lot of it is now on the open data website, but not necessarily all of it. So you may still need to go through GTE to get some of it. And uh, at this stage, I think that OGDE typically refers people who need maps to the map and data center because we can download it and subsequently provide it to other people in addition to the initial other 
map and data services available on campus. You, I already told you about ArcGIS. There's SAS and SPSS available in the Gen Labs and on my VLAB. Uh, ArcGIS is available in the Gen Lab in Social Science Center room 1032. Uh, I think that the only place a person who isn't in social science is currently can use Stata, if that's the software package you want to use, is in the Map and Data Center on those shared machines that we have there. So if you're working in Stata or want to work in Stata, that's where you'll have to come if you don't have a personal copy. Okay. So, we've talked about the website and it just vanished for the fourth time. Let's look at the Equinox system. As was said, this is a system that we developed here at Western in association with the Quebec universities. Today I heard on the radio that the Supreme Court of Canada is beginning to look at Senate reform or take arguments about the Senate. Uh, so I thought, well, let's look for Senate reform and Equinox and see what we find. And it's not very much. And I knew it wouldn't be very much. When we search for a, a phrase, it searches all of the information that we have stored in an in, an in Magic database um, and then builds the results that we see here. So we're actually querying a database which in turn builds pages that you query to retrieve data from a SQL database, ultimately. Um, so it's a highly developed system for querying and returning information. When we do a query, by default, it searches information about the file. So this is title, abstract, any notes that we've included about it. It includes information about the variable, so the variable name, the variable label. Uh, what was the question that was actually asked? Do you believe Senate reform would be useful? Okay, if that was the question, this variable would be picked up in the retrieval. Uh, and it also searches responses to questions. So for example, if what is the most important issue facing Canada today? If someone responded Senate reform, that would be recorded as one of the variables that got retrieved and that forced a file to be brought back. So when we look at this, we only have two files, uh, 1993 and 1992. I'm not surprised because most of our holdings are data liberation initiative holdings and Statistics Canada does not ask that type of question. So let's look at the 1992 Charlottetown Accord. If you want to retrieve a subset, you can. If you want to retrieve the entire file, all 245 variables, you can do that. But let's go down. I'm going to ask this, and I'm not insulting you, but I often find when I do a class and mention this, people don't know that this feature exists. Control F for finding stuff on web pages you all know about. Good, I'll skip it then. Uh, frequently people don't know that, and if nothing else, they've come away with a really valuable tip <laughs> from the class. So, here we've got a number of questions about the Senate. Now, probably the file was retrieved because in the abstract or in the codebook information about the file, there was the phrase Senate reform. Here, none of these have the phrase Senate reform in them, or else the variable would have been picked out as something that specifically interested us. So here we see such things as, which do you prefer, the Senate as now or proposed? Well, what was the actual question text? You prefer the Senate as it is, not the Senate as proposed, or doing away with the Senate. Okay, and of the people who responded to this question, a majority said that they prefer to do away from it if you discount the people who said they don't know. But there are also 1,500 people, 1,600, who weren't asked the question. Well, that's kind of peculiar. Well, the reason for that is that they did experiments with question wording in this census. So the next question is, do you prefer the Senate 
and they change the order of the terms. And then the third question, they change the order again. So, part of this is likely intended to be to allow them to assess whether question wording had an impact, uh, as well as assess people's responses. So you see before, we've now got exactly the same number who want to keep it as proposed or as it is now, who agreed with doing away from it. And if we look at the third variable, a minority of people wanted to do away with the Senate. So whether question wording is important, that's, that's not for me to say, but it's an interesting thing. And it's the type of thing that you need to be aware of when you're doing analysis. But Equinox will burrow down into this and let you retrieve variables. So to retrieve these variables, well, I want to get all of these. And I want to get this one. Notice that we're returning sample frequencies. This is not weighted. This does not represent the number of people in Canada. Most Statistics Canada surveys, which this was not, include weight variables that let you transform the data from a survey, from sample results, to give you a population estimate. So for example, on drug surveys, how many people have used cocaine? People respond yes, because they trust that stats can protect their confidentiality. You see that 55 people said they've used cocaine in the last six months or whatever. When you expand that out using the weights to look at the entire Canadian population, that meant that about half a million people had used cocaine in the past year. A significant difference and a much more important number than that 55 or whatever it was in the survey said that they used cocaine. So whenever you have them and you're doing analysis, you should apply the weight variable because population estimates normally are what you're more interested in than survey responses. So to retrieve these, we'll select all of these variables. And we'll pull up a couple of variables, I think province of interview. Let's, maybe our research hypothesis was that Western Canadians are going to be more prone to want to abolish the Senate than all Eastern Go to the next step. If you want to limit it in any way, you can limit it. So, what are the value labels? Okay, standard value labels. We'll just leave it and say we want to retrieve this data for everyone. If you want a SAS, SPSS, or STATA command file, program file created, so the, the data will come back in uh, tab delimited ASCII format, easy to import into just about anything. But if you want to import it into SPSS, you can ask for it, put in your email, and submit the request, and this had better work because it worked earlier today. <laughs> What's now happening is the system is going off, or, thank you, and retrieving metadata about the file and about the variables and storing it in documentation and creating the SPSS file. It's going off to SQL and retrieving the data file. Then bundling everything together into a single zip file. You also are emailed a link. And you can then extract these files. There is security on them. You're emailed that as well in the link. And what does this say? Well, first of all, Y2K data warning. This, this shows how long I've been here. I remember having to put this on every file that had a date variable that wasn't standard four digit. So if we had to warn people that at least one variable was stored with only two digits for date, be careful how you use it. It was quite a tedious process, I can tell you. Uh, but there's a bibliographic citation, not in any particular format, but in the standard format that was recommended by Sue Dog for citing machine-readable data. Uh, but 
but that, of course, can be modified into whatever you want. Codebook information, so a description of the file, and down at the end of, the of that, links to each variable that we retrieved with all of the question text. So a customized codebook for what you have actually pulled out. zip file, the SPSS file. Uh, we can open, but I'm just going to view it. So all of the syntax that you need for manipulating an SPSS, except for one thing. We don't know where you're going to extract the data file to. Because we don't know that, we just put in square bracket path. You have to tell SPSS or SAS or STATA where you've actually saved the file on disk. None of those programs are smart enough on a non-UNIX system to be able to go into a zip file and retrieve the data out of a zip file, so you have to physically extract them from a zip somewhere onto their disk, whether it's USB or whatever else, and then point, to, point the program to it. So we've got all of the variables that were in here, all of the labels, all of the missing declarations. Everything's done. All we need to do is the analysis, simple as pie. So that is um, how to retrieve microdata uh, from Equinox. Now, microdata, when you're doing a survey, you collect responses from each individual in the survey. And a microdata file is a file that contains responses for each individual. Aggregated data would be something collected up. So let's say we were to construct a very quick aggregated data set for this group of people in here. We've got three males, four females. We've got two people over age, 30 in the room, I expect, maybe three, uh, five under age 30. Now, if we have a table of age, under 30, over 30, and a table with male, female, you can't tell age by gender. You have two discrete pieces of information. You don't have the ability to bang them together and say, well, because five out of seven people in the room were under age 30, that means that five-sevenths of the males were under age 30. Um, it would be like saying, well, we know that half of the population is male and half of the population is female. We know that 20% of the population earns over $100,000. Therefore, 20% of the female population earns over $100,000. Statistically unsound. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, so, aggregated data answers a question that someone else has already posed. Microdata allows you to answer questions that you pose, because if you had a table with gender and age for each person in this room, you could create a file that shows age, or a table, aggregated data, that shows age by gender, or gender by place of birth, by province or whatever it might happen to be, or in Canada, outside of Canada. But microdata lets you answer any question that the data will support. Aggregated data answers questions someone has thought. So let's try and quickly find an aggregated data set and just show you how you would use that. Uh, depending on the file, it may look exactly the same. So census <coughs> tabulations, basic summary tabs from the census, we've loaded into Equinox, but the unit of analysis isn't an individual. It's a geographic area. Therefore, the data have been aggregated to a particular level of geography. Um, let's look at the labor force historical. Historical, historical. Okay, so 
to access the data for that. There are different cycles of labor force historical review available. Let's look at the 2010. And we can look at educational attainment. Okay. So we've got age, sex, annual averages. So we can look at this, and this is a Beyond 2020 file, which is a proprietary format used by StatCan. You can download a Beyond 2020 viewer for a Windows-based machine from us. There is no Mac client for it. But if your Apple or Mac emulates Windows, you can use it on that. And what does this show us? Well, let's look at the number of people who have fewer than eight years of education in Canada over time. One of the nice things about the um, Beyond 2020 is it very quickly lets you create charts. And to right click on the chart, copy it and paste it into a um, paste it into a word or word perfect or whatever document you're working with. So not surprisingly, the number of people in Canada with less than eight years of education has been dropping over time. Most people now attend school at least through high school or through part of high school. So as the population ages, the number of people with less education falls. You can display a couple of characteristics at once if you want. Not surprisingly, the number of people with at least some post-secondary education is going up. So, now, these are results from the Labor Force Survey, which is a monthly survey conducted by StatCan, which they in turn have aggregated to produce annual figures and annual estimates. Yeah. Did I notice that it was only up to 2010? In this, uh, that's the most recent version of the file that was produced. I'm not sure if there is going to be another one produced because there were a lot of budget cutbacks at StatCan and I think Labor Force Historical Review was one of the targets. So I'm not sure that there will be future versions of Labor Force Historical Review to which we can provide you with access. I wish I didn't have to say that, but um, when we go to the StatCan website, we'll check that and see what the last edition is. Um, so, access to aggregated data if it's in Beyond 2020 format, by all means install the software on that if you don't have access to it. It is, I believe, in the Gen Labs, and it certainly is available on the uh, machines in the Map and Data Center. And this is something that you might want to use whether you're getting data from Equinox or from StatCan or from Odyssey, it's a more ubiquitous tool. And as a point of note, the partnership between Equinox, between Western and Crayfoot, those IVT files are actually coming to you from a server at Laval. So they mount them, they provide the HTML access, we point to them, you go to them, your IP address is checked, and if you check out, you do get access. All of these systems, Equinox, Odyssey, and Scholars Portal, you need to authenticate in order to be able to use using the proxy server. And I'm sure you're familiar with the proxy server through Western Libraries for off-campus access. So, that's a very quick introduction to Equinox. Let's now go to Odyssey and search for Senate reform. Same query. Okay. Found 41 files. Let's sort by date. And here we can see Canada election study portraits of Canada. Why so many files more there than in Equinox? They include public opinion survey data, which are not present in Equinox. 
they have access to additional files. We've actually shared some of our files with them. They've mounted versions of some of the files that we prepared in Odyssey. But the big difference is that there are public opinion surveys. So if we go down Canadian Gallup poll from 1993. Um, so portraits of Canada 2003. Should the Senate of Canada be reformed? Gee, looks very familiar, very much like the questions that were asked in the constitutional survey that we were looking at before from the Charlottetown Accord. And in fact, that is one of the files that's available in the system. Um, oddly enough, the numbers aren't as strikingly uh, in favor of abolishment in 2003 as they were in 1992. So if you were looking at doing a paper where you're comparing results over time, you can go back. If we go to the very end of the page, when did they first begin to start asking questions about this? Okay, well, no, that isn't the most, that isn't the oldest one. I saw one that was earlier than that, I'm sure. Page four. just Senate that I was looking for as opposed to Senate reform. Uh, I did a couple of different searches, but there were questions about the Senate in the 1950 Gallups in Canada as well. Uh, but they may not, might not have had the word Senate reform. Uh, to retrieve data from Odyssey, uh, you've got to explore and download. It's not retrieve data and in fact gives you information you then have to say well let me see the variable description so let's look at important issues for Canada what's the most important issue first or second mention to download the data click on the diskette and it's by far easier to download it's by far easier and they recommend downloading the entire file rather than trying to subset out of Odyssey because it's a somewhat more difficult process. But if you want the whole file, select the data format. You can specify what you want. SPSS portable, SAS, data, delimited, dbase if you want it to import it into ArcGIS. So let's say we want SPSS. And here's where you would subset it, but it is quite tedious picking up the variables you want. So we'll just download it. And this is going to block me, should block me and say you don't have the rights to download this, there we go. save set which is the SPSS native format. We have a PDF document which is the entire data files uh, codebook. And that you get regardless of whether you subset or whether you ask for the entire file. You always get the complete documentation that's stored in the system. So that's another difference between the two systems. But generally they're providing access to the same material or a lot of the same material. The difference is that uh, the key difference is that the uh, Odyssey system has all of the public opinion surveying data as well, which particularly if you're in journalism or particularly if you're looking at trends, uh, public perception over time may be useful to you. Uh, your mileage will vary as to which one you prefer. Um, let us go to... The scholars portal with scholars geo portal excuse me um, I didn't show you retrieving a map file in Equinox it's pretty boring you find the layer click on it and download the file you can't manipulate it at all 
so there's nothing really sexy to do other than get it and then use it on your online system. With this one, you can actually say, well, I'm interested in looking at London. Uh, yeah, London, Ontario. Yeah, that's what I'm after. Okay. Now, what type of data do we have? What do we have that's uh, agriculture and farming? Okay. A couple of different layers. So let's. this condition of use comes up, I agree, and all of a sudden we're getting a map of London with agricultural use. Of course, the city of London presumably doesn't have agricultural use, so it cuts out the borders of the area. But you can look at different things and add, for example, a uh, road layer. And let's say we want to add the aerodromes in London. There are actually four, not three or four, I don't remember which. One, two, three. Gosh, gosh, this looks like it's the university. What on earth is that aeroport? It's the helipad for the hospital. <laughs> so there's the National, uh, the International Airport and then the helipads at uh, UH and at Victoria Westminster campus. Let's add a road layer, uh, a, a different layer. Let's add the rail lines, sure. So you can gradually build up a map which you can print or save or send a link to someone. So this actually lets you do some basic mapping online that you can then use. If you're doing a project uh, for which you need to create a map, this may be enough without your having to learn how to use ArcGIS. Now merging data into it would be more difficult, but eh, maybe you can get away without it depending on what you do. So, that's the Scholar's Geoportal. And, it's 10 to 1, good heavens. Questions? Too much, too much to take in? I've flown through an awful lot of stuff. Um, when I do classes, giving a slightly more detail about, oh, well, there is one other thing I haven't shown StatCan website. And that's in the program that I said I was going to do, but I didn't create a link. So I forgot about it. Okay. StatCan website. I think it will work in English. It is confusing. It is difficult. They change it on a regular basis without telling anyone. I don't think it's different today from when I looked at it last week. But I'll remain, uh, it's possible that I'll be surprised. So, wide range of data. You can search for it in a number of different ways. You can search by subject, you can search by featured group, you can search by free text. I generally consider that there are probably four main areas of the, of the StatCan website. There is CANSIM, which is time series data over 30 million different time series. And this is everything from unemployment rate in, on, in Ontario on a monthly basis since whenever it started, adjusted for seasonality, as opposed to an unadjusted for seasonality time series of the same data, to housing construction, to the number of people flying into London International Airport from foreign destinations. Oddly enough, there are many more people flying into and out of London in the winter, as we look out at the snow today, uh, than there are in the summer. In part because, of course, there are chartered flights that are put on 
in the winter that aren't available in the summer. So direct flights you can't take to Cuba in the summer, for example. So uh, you can, Kansan is one step. The census and the National Household Survey, which is more or less the proxy for the census, um, is the second set of information. Um, the third set is the geographic information. Generally, you find it through the web, through the census pages. And the fourth set are all of the different reports that Statistics Canada produces, which may contain data, may contain some analysis of the data, but don't immediately jump out at you and say, hi, this is I'm the piece of information that you're really looking for. So let's look at literacy. <clears throat> what information do we have about literacy in the thought? About 58 things. Further results from the adult literacy and life skill. Jean, I think I mentioned the adult literacy surveys that were conducted by StatCan. Let's see what this says. So we can look at the full PDF version of this document on the website and see what information is in it. Let's look at the conclusion only. Uh, main findings. <coughs> Difference in level and distribution are associated with large differences in economic and social outcomes. So that's presumably to be expected or, or not unexpected. Um, population means aren't changing. Numeracy, low proficiency in numeracy. Who's afraid of numbers? Presumably none of you here or you wouldn't have come <laughs> to this session. How many of your colleagues look at you when there's a stats assignment and say, I don't do numbers. A lot of people are worried about it. A lot of people are worried about having to use them. Uh, it's a core skill. When you look at a newspaper and you see that there is, uh, I looked at the Gazette a year and a half ago. And I was looking at the results of the football game and saw that in a 60 minute football game, Western had the ball for 34 minutes, and the other team had the ball for 32 minutes. Not being able to look at this and immediately say, wait, there should only be 60 minutes in the game. Something must be wrong with these data. What is the problem? That should be a core thing that people can do without, without really thinking about it too much. If you know anything about football. Presumably the sports editors do. <laughs> so, different things from the StatCan website. Let's look at CanSim. Let's go all the way back. StatCan and look at CanSim. Um, oh, we were also going to look for the Labor Force Historical Review on the StatCan site and see what the most recent publication date is. So let's look at travel and tourism and look at international travel and look at uh, what one do we want? Number of international travelers entering or returning to Canada by type of transportation. That looks interesting. Now, this is one of the times I tell you download beyond 2020. Manipulating data on the StatCan website is a pain. You can do it, but you need to go to the add, remove data, pain, find London. And then you need to go down to the next bit and find traveler characteristics, but you can download the entire file as a beyond twenty twenty five. Mm -hmm. 
So now we have everything in here. We can say, well, in my geography, I want to select London in my characteristics. So dimension, not sort. Dimension, sort. of it. Okay, and we want to limit the time period to the final past five years, let's say. Item show, and we want to look at Canadian Residents returning. Beyond 2020 is no, not necessarily the greatest tool either, but it's still better than using the Stat Canada website. <coughs> so returning by countries other than the United States by air directly, and then we of our data and discover that oddly enough people in London, a lot of people in London tend to go south in the winter, who would think. And these are people flying directly out of Canada to foreign destinations. Last site is the census at StatCan. Uh, rapidly running out of my promise time. Uh, they're going to keep three versions of the census online. Currently they have four. I don't know what they're going to do with the 96 census. This archived simply means that they have not converted it to the most recent uh, Treasury Board standard and that they are not planning to convert it to the most recent Treasury Board standard. They promise that they will continue to provide access to the data but you may need to ask for it. Um, we're trying to download as much as we can so that we can provide direct access to it without people having to ask for it. One of the things you can do is look at profiles. Uh, let's look at the profile of Winnipeg. So, come on. The census doesn't have much in it because, of course, the long form census was cancelled. You've got age marital status, number of children, so family structure, household characteristics, some, and mother tongue, which was added because Quebec was going to do a constitutional uh, case against them if they didn't include it. Where did the rest of the census go? The education, income, uh, place of birth, religion, ethnicity, place of work, how much time you spent doing unpaid work at home, either looking after kids, seniors, or doing housework. All of these, inf all of these files, variables, were put into the National Household Survey, which is a voluntary census, uh, which was conducted. Initially, well, StatCan found out that the census was cancelled after they had already printed the long forms. So they had to shred all of the long form censuses in 2011. Collecting the National Household Survey cost over $30 million more than collecting the census would have cost. And unfortunately, it's providing data that are the quality thereof, which is in question. Uh, Globe and Mail has had a number of articles about the quality of it. Um, one of the things that it's found, one of the first releases was from the National Household Survey that I think the largest immigrant group in the past five years was from the Philippines. Uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada said, that's interesting, that's not what our official records say. It was from some other country. When you look at income, income inequality is declining according to the National Household Survey. Unfortunately, when you look at income tax records from the Canada Revenue Agency, it's not the case. Uh, instead, what happened with the National Household Survey being a voluntary survey is that 
high-income people, low-income people generally didn't report or often reported many fewer than would be the case with the census. Consequently, not as many low-income people, not as many high-income people. Hey, income inequality is coming down. This is a good thing. These are various pages. Um, suppression, because of the way it was done, Stadpan decided on the public website that if there was 50% non-response or less, or sorry, 50% or higher non-response, areas would automatically be blacked out, wouldn't be available on the website. What that means is, this is the map of Canada, oh, with <laughs> census subdivision, so town, city, uh, township, Indian reserve, blacked out as a result. So, when you look at a lot of the issues, should there be a pipeline to the Pacific? There's no data publicly available from the NHS on the census divisions for most of the length of the Pacific Coast. If you live in Manitoba, well, if you live in Winnipeg, you're probably okay. You're going to have data. <laughs> if you live in Churchill, which I would have thought would have been large enough to be uh, actually picked up without a problem, those data are suppressed on the public website at the census subdivision level. So, lots of data that are not available. Um, a colleague of mine in BC sent this cartoon, and I love it. Uh, that census results are in, 31% of Canadians won't complete a voluntary census. Margin of error on everything else is your guess, this is, this is mine. And frankly, that's the case, because that can, can't prove who didn't complete the census, so they don't know what the difference is actually are. Some of the researchers are actually calling for the NHS to be repealed, the data withdrawn and simply not used. Um, I'm not going to do that, but the ramifications of this go a long way. If you're going into public library, one of the things you may want to do is have a program for uh, English for non-English speakers, second language. If you don't know the number of non-English speakers in the area, it's going to be hard to make the case. It's going to be hard to make the case for a lot of different things if the data are unreliable. So my plea to people is that you contact your MP and write a letter and ask for the reinstatement of the long-form census for 2016. There's nothing we can do about 2011. That's, that's a ripple in the water that's, that's dying out already. But if we don't get reliable data for 2016, we'll then have 10 years without any news. And in fact, uh, if it was restored in 2011 or 2021, 20 years of religion data wouldn't be available because religion was last reliably collected in 2001 with the census. So, I hate to end on a down note, but this is a reality. Budget cuts, stat cap. Let's look for the Labor Force Historic Review. This is the methodology you would use to find out that information when the most recent one is. Um, I'm not going to ask you to stay through because we're already past our time. I do want to thank you for coming. I hope it's been useful. I hope you've learned something. And I hope that if you have questions about data or maps or about finding data or maps, 
that you now need to know where to come or where you now need to go, for, where to go for assistance. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.